Our next topic is transitioning from your pediatrician to adult cardiologist. Uh, Dr. Tom Young yeah. is uh, 20 years in practice. He is both an adult and a pediatric cardiologist practicing at Ochsner or Oxner Health System in New Orleans. Dr. Young. Thank you. So first of all, I hate talking about this subject, so I'm, in the interest of time, I'm going to make this brief because I think the psychosocial aspects that's coming up next are, are really, really important. Um, and the reason why I hate talking about this is there's really no good data. We'll mention that in a little bit. So this is a lot of expert opinion, which is once again just a bunch of people around a table drinking beers and deciding what you should do instead of anything based on real data. Um, and secondly, um, you know, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here because most of you people have transitioned. This is a talk that's better given to adolescents. And I really think this is a talk that's better given to pediatric cardiologists and pediatricians. Let's see if maybe it's this one. Yep, there we go. So, um, but this is the important part of this. Um, transfer of care is this point in time. It's when suddenly you're getting cared for by the adult doctor, not the pediatric doctor. Um, transition is a process. And transition is really what we want to talk about. Transition is the purposeful, planned, and timely transition from child and family-centered pediatric health care to patient-centered, adult-oriented health care. Um, and the goal of transition really specifically is uninterrupted care. This is the big thing. We're trying to prevent interruption in care to patients. Um, what are the goals of transition? The patient certainly has a lot of goals. A big one is to learn your heart disease. What you were born with, what operations you had, why you had them, what medicines you're on, why you were on them. You need to become your own advocate and something we as doctors need to do is impress upon you that, you, that lifelong care is gonna be necessary. Parents, we need to promote independence in the child it's a big thing, but another big thing is to continue to support the child. That kind of late teen, early 20s is a very vulnerable time, and those patients typically need mom and dad to kind of help remind them what they should be doing. Um, and it's important for the parents to understand that transfer of care is a sign of success. This is a good thing. Um, nowadays, when I diagnose a newborn baby with tetralogy, Part of my initial discussion with that family is you're going to see a heart doctor for the rest of your life. Um, and really early, we make sure they understand that it's not always gonna be me in a pediatric environment. It's, it potentially could be me somewhere else or it could be another doctor. Um, but people get that drilled into them every visit, which is different than how it used to be. Uh, let's see here. For physicians, start the transition process early. Um, identify an ACHD team and build a relationship with that team and facilitate transfer of care. And this is really one of the most important things we can do. And to be clear, it's something that we really haven't figured out how to do well yet. It is so easy to get lost in follow up when, okay, well, you've just left my practice. You're supposed to go see Dr. So and so, but you don't show up. And I don't know that you didn't show up because I didn't. you weren't supposed to see me, but that doctor really didn't realize you didn't show up either because he's never seen you before. So how do we facilitate that? How do we prevent people from falling through the cracks is a really important thing. And everyone's got to be patient because this is a process. We're going to skip that. Um, here's what we know. Lapse of medical care which typically we define as like not seeing your doctor for three years or more, is associated with a three times higher risk of showing up needing something done urgently. Showing up with an arrhythmia in the emergency room that you need to get shocked out of. Showing up with something where you have to be rushed to the operating room or rushed to the, uh, to the cath lab. Um, and we have good recommendations out there. And a big one is if you have adult if you have congenital heart disease, at least once you should be seen in an adult congenital heart disease center. It may be the mildest congenital heart disease there is. It may be pulmonary valve stenosis that was ballooned and now there's no stenosis, but at least once you should be seen in that ACHD center. Um, busy slide, the point, I put this slide up 
simply to show that why do pediatric cardiologists refer to adult congenital heart disease centers? This is from almost 10 years ago. At that point, a quarter of the centers were not. Um, I would guess that 10 years later, it's a lot better. Um, but still, there are centers that need to do this better. But the things we want to avoid is, OK, well, you're going to go see the new doctor because you want to get pregnant, or you are pregnant. Or you're going to go see the new doctor because you've developed type 2 diabetes, or gout, or hypertension, or something else that the pediatric cardiologist isn't comfortable dealing with. It would be better to get transitioned before that happens so you're not meeting that new doctor for the first time when something traumatic is going on. Um, this is looking at predictors of gaps in care in adult congenital heart disease patients. And um, this was a study from about four years ago. And these are really awesome centers. You know, these are those centers that I look up to. I want to want to be like them. Um, they do it correctly. And yet, these really awesome centers, once again, gaps in care defined as greater than three years without seeing the congenital heart disease specialist. Moderate complexity, almost half of the patients had gaps. And severe complexity, I mean, we're talking your single ventricle Fontans, we're talking the transposition mustard patients, a quarter of them had gone over three years without seeing a congenital heart disease expert. So these great centers still had a lot of problems with interruption in care. Why? What predicted this? Not surprising, we're talking 22-year-olds, I feel fine. Why do I need to go to the heart doctor, right? And so that's something that we as pediatric cardiologists need to do a better job of. We want to keep you feeling fine, right? You don't have to feel sick to go see your heart disease doctor. In fact, it's better that you, that you feel fine. Um, but there are other ones that are kind of predictable. Loss of insurance, um, financial issues. I moved. I didn't know who to go see. Once again, this is stuff that we need to do a better job of when we're seeing you when you're 14 to help prevent um, from happening when you get older. Um, this is just looking at internal medicine doctors who are receiving pediatric patients with complex disease, not just heart disease, sickle cell, cystic fibrosis, those kind of childhood diseases that are becoming adult diseases now. What do internal medicine uh, doctors think about getting those patients? They're scared, OK? To be very clear, they've got a lot of concerns. And those concerns really can be summed up with two things. Am I competent to take care of the patient? And do I have enough time to take care of the patient? And I think it's important for you guys to understand that it is stressful for, an in for a primary care doctor to see you for the first time in your clinic. And what you can do is understand that, make sure they get records early, figure out how long they have for you. Because if it's a 10-minute slot, um, that's going to be tough to meet you for the first time. I think congenital heart disease docs, we, we get pretty good at figuring out which patient, even though we've got 30 minutes to see you, it's going to take an hour to see this one, but the next one I could see in five minutes. Um, it's a lot harder when you're a, a primary care doctor and you're looking at 10, 15 minutes per patient uh, before they have to move on. Um, talking about data, just to sum this up, there are no good studies. Um, there is work. There's a trial going on up in Canada looking at some interventions on how to decrease gaps in care. We're not going to spend time with that. But once again, we have guidelines that is not backed up by any data, just experts saying what they think you should do. Um, and I'll summarize those guidelines in a second. Um, what protects patients from loss to follow-up? Well, one is being really sick. So if you're really sick, you're going to keep seeing your doctor. We don't want to make you really sick so you keep seeing the doctor. But what are other things? The patient and the family understanding that specialized adult care is necessary forever. That's something I can do when I'm seeing you when you're younger. Attendance at the pediatric appointments without the parents. So this is hard. And I like to say I, would, I do this well. I don't. But it would be best for the, parent, for the patient if I made the parents leave the room for 10 minutes every time I see them. And, that, and part of that is the sex, drugs, and rock and roll stuff that we do. But another part of it is just getting the 15-year-old comfortable talking to a doctor. So when they're 22, and for the first time they're going to go see the doctor without their parents, they aren't uncomfortable with this. Because if you're uncomfortable with something, you might just go, ah, I'm going to blow that off and not go. 
Um, what else? Uh, re direct referral from the pediatric cardiologist to an adult congenital heart disease center. I think we do a much better job. Gone are the days, hopefully, of, all right, you're 18, go find an adult cardiologist. Um, and hopefully even gone are the days of, okay, well, here's a good telephone number, give them a call. Uh, we need to do a better job of helping arrange visits, transferring um, medical records so people don't get lost to follow up. So what are the recommendations? When I first saw this, I thought it was crazy. Start at 12? Good Lord, that's really, really early. Um, what I realized, this is probably not early enough. Um, at least start laying the groundwork for this when the kids are young. I have a 14-year-old daughter, and 12 was a whole lot easier. Um, all the things I try to tell her at age 14, she listened when she was 12. She's not listening anymore. So I think that some of that stuff of teaching the kid about their heart disease and about their medicines, a 12-year-old is probably more receptive to that than a 15-year-old is. Um, transition, there's no hard and fast rule. You don't say you have to go at 18, you have to go at 21. Some patients are ready at 18. Some patients aren't ready when they're 21. There's developmental issues you have to take into account there as well. The adolescent needs to be engaged in their care. The adolescent needs to be educated. You have to force it, even though when you say, how are you feeling, and they immediately look at mom, <laughs> look at the patient and make them talk. Um, discuss current and long-term um, exercise goals. This is a big one, too. I do see a lot of adult congenital heart disease patients who come in, and they were told they can't exercise. And what we know is the vast majority of patients are going to be better off if they can exercise. I mean, there's new data with things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and other diseases where you should be exercising, which is completely counter to what we used to tell people. Um, really important, discuss limitations that could affect career choices. You know, getting part-time construction work probably isn't the best plan for that patient if they're going to have insurance. So directing them towards an, uh, towards an employer that has, you know, a big employer with group health insurance, thinking about those things early is really, really important. Um, the patient needs a medical home. And it can't be the adult congenital heart disease doctor that's treating the strep throat um, and do it. They need a primary care doctor to help care for these things. Um, but the ACHD cardiologist needs to guide cardiovascular care. Um, there are resources out there. There are a lot of them. This is from, was from the ACHA website. But also there's a new one, got, the GOT Transition. I don't know if anyone's seen this website. It's GOT, G-O-T, transition, dot org. And it's a really cool website for not just for congenital heart disease, but for adolescents who have childhood illnesses to help them transition. And there are a lot of tools for, for providers as well on that website. Um, so once again, our goals, we discussed this before. And that is it.